When I was a kid in Sunday school, the Sunday school teacher began her lesson on the parables by drilling it into us. A parable, she said to us, is a earthly story with a heavenly meaning. On one Sunday, she was telling the parable of the woman who was mixing in uh, the leaven with the flour to make the bread. And she started the parable. The kingdom of heaven is like, and then she told it, and I raised my hand. And I said, uh, Miss Sewell, since the parable began, the kingdom of heaven is like, I said, shouldn't we say the parable is a heavenly story with an earthly meaning? Exasperated, hard to imagine, she said, heavenly, earthly, earthly, heavenly, it doesn't matter, Marcus. The point is, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus, she said, wants us to connect heaven and earth. Jesus still wants us to connect heaven and earth. And he teaches us in ways that tease our imagination into an envisioning of how it is God's realm could be lived out where we live here solidly on earth. He tells these parables. A parable is a story that is thrown alongside like a sower reaching into their gunny sack and indiscriminately and lavishly throwing seed along the way. Stories thrown along the way of Jesus' own life and ministry to help us understand what it was he was preaching and teaching. The scripture says that when Jesus came on the scene, he was proclaiming the kingdom of heaven, not a kingdom of military might, of weaponry or bombs, not a kingdom of GDP, and certainly not an economic kingdom, certainly not a political kingdom where there are victories that oppress. Instead, Jesus comes ushering in saying the kingdom has drawn near in acts of justice and kindness. But it's one thing to say that and it's another to get our imaginations going so we could try to see it. So today he gives us six short parables. Some parables are long form like the parable of the Good Samaritan and the parable of the prodigal son. Larger stories, technicolor in its vividness. These are not very long. They're short. In fact, they're almost proverbial in nature. Comparing in one or two sentences what the realm of the divine and the common and the ordinary what that looks like when it's mixed. And so Jesus starts by using everyday common things to get us to start thinking in new ways about God's reign and realm. Now, Mrs. Sewell did not know the classic C.H. Dodd definition of a parable, which goes like this. A parable, he said, in its simplest form is a metaphor or simile drawn from nature or common life and the images arrest the reader or the hearer in a way and it draws out of it because of its strangeness or vividness some uncertainty as to its precise meaning, application. It teases us, he said, into active thought. 
Now, if Mrs. Sewell had said that to us fourth grade boys, we would not have understood. But we get metaphor and simile drawn from nature in everyday life. The first two are about common, ordinary things. A mustard seed. A mustard seed is thrown out, reached in, the sower does, into that gunny sack, and isn't really planning on growing mustard. The mustard seed is just hidden in the seed of what the sower is trying to really grow. It's been hidden in the sack. And it's tossed. And that mustard seed, which is really growing into a weed, keeps growing. It wasn't designed to do that. The sower did not have that in mind, but before you know it, it grows into a large bush and then a tree. That's probably not true, but we don't need to worry. Jesus isn't a botanist or an arborist, and he's given permission to be a bit exaggerated. The point, of course, is that it becomes large, so large that it sprouts branches, and the branches then give the birds a place to rest. And then, Jesus says, uh, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast. Yeast that a woman in her Galilean kitchen and oven will take, and it too has been hidden, and she's going to take three measures of flour. Now, don't think that that's not a lot. In fact, it's probably somewhere between 40 and 60 pounds of flour. Is that wasteful? Is it extravagant? It's more bread than this woman is herself going to eat, but maybe that's the point, that she's going to be not foolish, but generous. The kingdom of heaven is like a woman who over-prepares so that food could be enjoyed and all could have bread. Amy Jill Levine says that in these two particular parables, what's at issue is actualizing potential. That you have to plant the seed, whether it's what you meant to plant or not. And the leaven has to find its way into the flour, into the bread. It's only when it is actualized that the potential grows into what it should be. Every day, common elements. In order for us to envision something different. And so, the next two parables have everything to do with ultimate value and those things that seize our hearts and redirect us. So, a guy finds a treasure hidden in a field. It's not his field. And he finds that treasure. And instead of knocking on the door and saying, hey, I found this treasure in your field, what he does is he hides it and then decides, I've got to sell everything I have to buy the field. Now, that's a little shady, isn't it? But that's what he does. And then the pearl of great price, lots of pearls, but hidden like that treasure, like that yeast, like those seeds, that pearl of great price in among all of the ordinary pearls is discovered. And when it's discovered, our friend decides, 
I have to liquidate all my assets. I have to buy it. Does it make sense? In a ledger of pros and cons, would it have meant that he should have done that? The point here, of course, is Jesus is saying, Matthew's Jesus is saying, there are moments when something seizes your heart and your life and redirects you and priorities change. That is the kind of life of discipleship that all of Matthew's gospel is inviting us to. That once you see and discover the hidden treasure or the pearl of greater value than all the others, Jesus will say, where your treasure is, we'll be able to find your heart too. The next one is around fish, also pretty common. And you go out for a night of fishing, you drag the nets in, and some are delectable and some not so good. And what you do is you have to make a choice and you choose to differentiate between those you can eat and others can eat and those that, that can't be eaten. And in this parable, Matthew's Jesus is saying, there are moments when in that decision to go in this way, you have to be prudent. Yes, extravagant and generous and awakened, discovered. But you also have to be aware that not all fish are for the eating. And then lastly, the parable says, someone invites you over. And after the meal, they say, hey, let me show you some things. And they bring out some treasures of theirs. And some of the treasures are new, recently found, prized, but relatively short period of time. And they show them to you. And they say, but, but wait a second, too. We want to show you the heirlooms, the old treasures. Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven includes both new treasures and old treasures. Connect them. Don't just connect heaven and earth. Connect and keep old treasures and make new ones so that those treasures bridge together a life of goodness and peace and justice. When he died last week, John Lewis, the congressman from Georgia, he was remembered by American historian and active Episcopal layperson John Meacham as saying, Meacham said, the thing about John Lewis is he never forgot to ground his justice in the Christian gospel. That growing up in Troy, Alabama, preaching to the chickens out in the field, he always remembered that justice is a challenge and a choice he called him a saint, and indeed, he was. Parker Palmer, the great Quaker theologian, recounts a story of going with Lewis to Selma on one of the anniversary trips around Bloody Sunday. And Lewis was talking to everyone on the bus, getting them ready for that experience of walking across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And he told everybody on the bus this story. In 1961, 
a full four years before Lewis would have his head bashed in on Bloody Sunday. He and a friend are in Rock Hill, South Carolina, and they're at the bus station. And while they're waiting there, a group of white boys with baseball bats attack them and they leave them savagely bloodied. Then they leave. Lewis and his friend decide not to press charges. And they go on with their civil rights work. Forty-eight years later, in 2009, a man walks into John Lewis's office at the U.S. Capitol. And he says, with his middle-aged son in tow, Mr. Lewis, my name is Elwin Wilson, and I was one of the boys that attacked you that night, and I'm here to atone for my sin, and I have come to seek and ask for your forgiveness. Will you forgive me? That was the exact same question that Alabama Governor George Wallace would ask Lewis also years after Bloody Sunday. And Lewis said to Elwin Wilson, yes, I forgive you. And he told the bus, we embraced, we wept, and then we talked. As he finished that story and sat down next to Parker Palmer, you could tell that just the stirring of those memories took him back to a lot of different places. And he looks out the window of the bus and he sees field after field. Those same fields that had been killing fields for the KKK of which Elwin Wilson had been a part. And he said softly, as if to himself, but Parker Palmer heard it, and he said, people can change. People can change. People can. There can be enough leaven to leaven a loaf and we rise. And in the hearing of love and justice and mercy, our hearts and our minds and our lives can be seized by another power. We make a choice and a decision and we follow. And we bridge the old and the new, the Black Lives Matter and the Civil Rights Movement from the 50s and 60s to today. That there are some people who decide that they themselves will be a living parable, that they will become a bridge builder. And what makes Lewis what Meacham called a saint was that his sense of justice was rooted in this gospel, that the kingdom of heaven is trying to connect heaven to earth. May it be so for us. Thanks be to God. Amen and amen.